So we're, uh, we're talking about this series of being anxious and afraid, and I just got to be honest with you, uh, I'm probably not the right person to be speaking on this, because as far as courage goes, uh, I'm, I'm not the best candidate. I am afraid of a lot of things, and maybe you can relate. Uh, nobody has done this yet in this series, and I thought I would do it. Uh, I searched five different lists and compiled across the board what are the top ten most common phobias Americans have. What would you guess some of the things on the list are? Spiders. Spiders was the number one on all five of them. So, yes. What else? Snakes. Snakes was number two on all but one of them. Are you guys reading off the list? Are you guys on Google right now? Like, oh, yeah. What else? Speaking in public. Speaking, okay, so heights, yes. Speaking in public, no. And this was shocking to me because it used to be, for a long time, it was the overwhelming number one, which Jerry Seinfeld famously made funny by saying that that means that the average funeral the person would rather be in the casket than, than speaking on the stage. Uh, and yet, no, on all five lists, not one of them listed public speaking once. Which I, So someone's lying. Uh, or my job's a lot easier. One of the two. Uh, we'll go with lying. What else? Fire. Fire. Fire did not come up. Buried alive. Financial wasn't one. Buried alive, no. <laughs> Loss of what? Child. Loss of a child was not on the list. Although some of these, I think, because there may not necessarily be a something a, a phobia, they may not make the list for that reason. Dark, Dark was kinda. What someone say? Claustrophobia. Claustrophobia, absolutely, on multiple lists. Anything else? Perfect. So here, here's what I found. Top ten. Fear of holes. What? I don't know. Fear, fear of flying. That one makes sense. Fear of germs. Fear of small spaces. Claustrophobia. Fear of lightning and thunder. Fear of insects. Fear of open spaces. So we don't like small spaces, but we also don't like big spaces. We need just the right amount of spaces to be comfortable. Uh, fear of heights, snakes, spiders. It's really interesting to me that, that both one and five, that not just insects in general, but then also specifically spiders, that both made that list. This is really incredible to me, especially because of the things, some of the things that we're missing, like fear of public speaking, or maybe, I don't know, fear of failure or death. Apparently those things don't bother us. Um, what's really in incredible to me is how much I think that anxiety plays a role in how we do everyday life. Would you agree? I think fear and anxiety have a huge, uh, an unknown, an, I think we are unaware of the impact that those two can sometimes have. For example, in the most recent presidential election, the average person in the United States did not vote for a candidate, but rather voted against a candidate for the first time in history. Which was to say, we were so afraid of the other person, we voted for someone. We didn't vote for them because we liked them, we voted against someone else. Does that make sense? And so, so I think fear and anxiety are at an all-time high in our culture, and I think it's really disappointing because I think we miss out on a whole bunch of stuff for that reason. Reason. Uh, when we talk about fear and anxiety, uh, somebody drew this distinction. I think it's really helpful. Fear is more emotionally raw and, and stimulus bound. So a spider walks into the room, and if you have arachnophobia, that is going to make you afraid. Whereas anxiety is much more cognitive, and it's also future oriented. So if you're thinking about the past, that's not anxiety. That's typically depression. Uh, but if, if, if there's stress involved, if there's stress about the future, that's anxiety. That's what we're talking. Does that make sense? Uh, the other thing is this. Fear, fear as a whole... Um, I mean, when something happens to you and your body responds with fear, that's physiological. Right? You can't control. You ever have that happen? Something happens and you just, you're just you immediately afraid. Heart rate goes up. Blood, you can't feel your blood pressure go up maybe, but you, maybe you can. You, you, you start sweating a little bit. You guys know what I'm talking about? Can you control that? No, you really don't. So, so I, I'm not concerned with that. I'm concerned with what you do next. Right? Because you can't control the first part, but you can control what you ha let be step two. And that's what I want to talk about today. What's step two? When, when, when something happens and your heart rate is rushing and, and blood pressure is elevated, what do you do next? And, and I think that oftentimes, uh, and this is really broad strokes, but, but we have two choices. We can either give in to that fear, and, and what that has looked like for me is I begin to immediately start to expect or plan for the worst. You know what I mean? You start to think about what could go wrong. You start to, so maybe some of your fears start to become true. But, but then there's also responding in faith. And, and just generically, I would say that faith is looking at the unknown or the thing that's to come with, with some sort of sense that things will get better. That maybe for a second, my outlook shifts from what could go wrong to, but what could go right. Does, does that make sense? And, and, and what I want to challenge you today is, is this idea of, I want to figure out how do we respond in faith? 
We can't choose if we're afraid. That, that, that moment happens, and it is what it is, but how do, what does it look like in that moment to then respond in faith? That's what I want to take a look at together today. And, and to do that, I want to start uh, in the same place that this psychologist named Jordan Peterson starts in his book, 12 Rules for Life. Uh, I want to start talking about these guys, which I bet none of you thought this morning, I bet we're going to learn about lobsters. Uh, lobsters, uh, one of the things about lobsters is they have to have a great hiding place because at different points in a lobster's life, it will shed its shell and for that time, while it's waiting for its new shell to regrow, it's very vulnerable, right? You with me? And so it needs a place to hide so that it's protected during that really vulnerable time. And lobsters, the thing about hidey holes for lobsters is only one lobster per hole. That's a rule, apparently, in the lobster kingdom. And so, and so when a lobster wants a better hiding hole and it's already taken, something incredible happens. They fight. And I'm about to tell you how they fight uh, because it's really interesting. Step one is this. The lobster will show up. There's some one in the lobster hole. There's like, hey, I want that hole. And they will begin to do this weird boxing dance where they kind of mirror each other and they're like really like snapping their claws and doing all this stuff. And uh, that's level one and nothing really happens there uh, except to say that it's very clear there's a conflict about to happen. And if, if assuming that sometimes occasionally if one of them is really a coward, it'll run away. But other than that, typically we move to stage two. And at stage two, what happens is they start to now rather than just going side to side mirroring each other, they kind of take turns charging and then retreating at one another. But they also do this really weird thing where they release air bubbles out of their eyeballs or their eye holes and this com is a form of communication that lets the other lobster know about its health, weight and, and, and general overall mood which is the grossest form of communication in the history of the animal kingdom uh, but if that doesn't work and if the charging and retreating isn't enough to scare the other lobster off, then we move into stage number three and this one actually involves a little bit uh, uh, of combat and what happens in stage three is something I, I haven't YouTubed yet but I really want to because they will attempt to intimidate one another by flipping another lobster over. <laughs> and that just sounds like the funnest fight I've ever heard of. Can you imagine if schoolyard bullies did this? Like, I'm not going to give you a wedgie. I'm not going to, like, you know, I'm going to try and flip you over. That's my goal. Like, that would just be a lot of fun to watch. And, uh, and so they do, and, but occasionally a lobster gets flipped on its back, still doesn't care. Uh, or, or, or whatever, maybe they're just, you know, it doesn't work out. And so then we enter stage four. And stage four tends to be fatal for one of them. Because what will happen is they will charge at each other with their claws clamp onto an, uh, one of the eye uh, branches or, or maybe a tentacle or maybe a leg and then they'll use their tail to kick themselves backwards while holding onto that thing and thus do what? They rip it off and typically that leads to a lobster dying. Again, you probably didn't think you're going to learn about this today. Uh, what's really interesting and what this psychologist draws from this is what happens next. When you have a lobster that loses but doesn't die, they ran all these tests on that lobster. And there's some really interesting things they found. First off, that a lobster who has won in the past but eventually loses one battle is unlikely to desire to fight again for several days, even against an opponent he's already beaten. Does that make sense to you? So even though I've already beaten an opponent before, I go and I face this better guy and I lose to him, I'm not even willing to fight the guy I've beaten before because I am so low in confidence at that point. Does that, does that make sense to you, right? Yes. This is, we're getting into the mind of a lobster, to be clear. Um, <laughs> but then here's, here's what's really crazy. I don't know how big of a brain fits in there, um, but this is, this is a physiological event wherein it is not uncommon for a lobster's brain after a big defeat to basically dissolve and a new brain to form and it's a brain that has the mindset of a loser because it is, it, its brain cannot handle, I'm assuming it's not a super big brain, uh, its brain cannot handle the shift that takes place from being top dog to being a loser and so its brain basically just dissolves away and a new one shows up and they are now much more likely to just run at the first sign of conflict. Uh, they will no longer engage and you end up with this lobster that ends up in what, uh, well, what I like to call a, a negative feedback loop, which is uh, super, super simply this. You ever been a, f you ever, you ever been stressed in a situation? And when you're stressed, your blood pressure, heart rate, you get a little sweaty, 
but you, you also become a lot more observant, don't you? You ever walked into a situation and just felt like, nothing, I can't see anything wrong, but something doesn't feel right. You ever had that? And so then, so you look around, and, and that has a tendency for you to be, you're, you're more alert in that moment, and then you'll actually start to maybe potentially try and get through that particular place quicker. If you're passing through somewhere and you feel like something doesn't feel right, you'll speed up. Uh, if you're at a party and you're like, whoa, something is off, but you, you maybe, maybe you'll escape outside for a few minutes to kind of, you ever done something like that before? Okay, and then that, then though, um, Oftentimes that leads to an increase in fear because you're more aware, you're, you're seeing more things because of that you may increase. And that fear leads to an inability to deal with the stress. And then, and then you're, now, now not only are you stressed, you're stressed about the stress that you started with, which makes you more heightened and more aware. And your blood pressure is now really going, your heart rate's through the roof, and you can't, like you're telling yourself, like, calm. You ever said this to yourself? Calm down. Has anyone ever said it and had it work? Yeah, no, right? It's like, calm down. Your body's like, ha uh-huh. uh, and, and this cycle ends up, and eventually you get to the point that you are stressed about the stress that you are stressed about. And it's cyclical. And, and I've always thought uh, that negative feedback loops were, uh, well, negative. Or bad, so to speak. But negative feedback loops aren't necessarily bad. They just are resistant to change. Negative feedback loops try and preserve what is. Positive feedback loops, on the other hand, embrace change. They're about change. And positive feedback loops can actually be negative. Are you confused yet? Here's my point. Negative feedback loop doesn't like change. Positive feedback loop likes change. In your day-to-day life, do you have more positive or negative feedback loops? Are you more interested in change or are you more interested in keeping things the same? Because lobsters will get to this place where they're defeated to the point that this negative feedback, and they not only get defeated, they're convinced they will always be defeated and they will never amount to anything. And then guess what? They do. And I'm convinced that sometimes humans aren't that different from lobsters. Would you agree? Yeah. Now, here's the thing that's crazy to me. And I mean, again, I don't know that there's a whole lot going on between the eyeballs there. But, but lobsters have to know they're not going to win every battle, right? Like a lobster has to know there's going to be setbacks, wouldn't you agree? And I would say the same thing. Humans got to know they're not going to win every time, right? Like there's going to be setbacks in your life. We, you know that, right? If not, you should be taking notes right now that there will be setbacks that will come. It, the thing isn't about the setbacks. Setbacks happen. It's what you do with them. And if you let them define who you become, then you'll be afraid of any new risk or challenge and you will never change. You will stay the same scared person that you are. And I'm kind of convinced that that's where a lot of our culture is right now. We're afraid. Now, by comparison, uh, also, it, um, I didn't ask earlier if anyone was arachnophobe, uh, but if you are, don't look at the screen for a second. Um, so there's a, what, did, what, did you not see it coming? I told you. Uh, it's a spider, right? We good? Okay. So anyway, uh, th- there was the group of uh, psychologists that got together and tried doing some, what they call exposure therapy. And they took a group of people with arachnophobia and not just like, oh, I don't really like spiders. Arachnophobia to the point that they wouldn't walk on a lawn for fear that there could be a spider hiding somewhere in there and that was debilitating to them. So this is a pretty severe form of arachnophobia. Would you agree? Okay. So they took these people, they put a tarantula in a terrarium and asked the people to get as close to the terrarium as they could. How close do you think they got? Ten feet was the average person. The average person stopped ten feet before the terrarium. And then what these psychologists did is they put together a plan that was based on exposing them and getting them step by step to embrace a new challenge until eventually they got to step 14, allow a tarantula to crawl on their ungloved hand. So step one was to get within five feet of the terrarium. And then step three was to, to actually put your hand on the terrarium, even though it was closed. And then step four was to like put your hand on the terrarium and near the spider. And then step, step seven was to take a paintbrush and direct the spider. And so like think that the point was like there were achievable steps. So you could go home at the end of the day and be like, guess what? I touched a spider. I, mean, I did it with a paintbrush, but I still, I did it, you know? And, and then eventually step, step nine was to allow a spider to crawl on your hand, but, but to have a really heavy glove on so you couldn't feel it. Uh, and then eventually step 14 was to let the spider crawl. On average, how long do you think it took this group to get to the point of step one, 10 feet away to step 14, allowing the spider to crawl on their hand? Six months. Two hours. And not just two hours, every single one of them did it. And six months later, they brought the same group back and none of them had a problem letting the tarantula crawl on their hand. And what's really interesting is these psychologists understand what video game makers have understood for some time. 
that you can't go from level 1 to level 160. Right? But you, go, you can go from level 1 to level 2. And your character maybe gets a little bit more skilled. And you have the confidence that you beat level 1, so you probably can handle level 2, right? But if you beat level 1 and they're like, great, next up level 70. Do you have a whole lot of confidence that because you did 1, you can do 70? And, but I think what's really interesting is they talked about breaking things down into bite-sized steps and how important that is for overcoming those cycles that keep us locked into a certain way of thinking. And so if you're somebody in this room that struggles with worry, then I'd really encourage you to listen for the next few minutes because I want to try and give some ideas and some ways and an example of how we can break out of that cycle uh, because I'm convinced if we don't, if we're resistant to change and we just keep doing things the way we always have and think the only options are either A, to always be afraid of the spider or B, to let it crawl on my hand and skip all 13 steps in between, we'll just constantly live in fear, right? Can you imagine if you had arachnophobia and someone was like, I am going to fix you and then they took a spider and without you knowing it, they threw it at you? Like, hey, here, catch. Would that work? No. You know. But if you broke it down into steps, would it work? Yeah. Apparently it would. Uh, if you have arachnophobia, don't look at the screen again for a second because I have to go back to this. If you've got your Bible, I want to look at a story of a guy in the Bible named Daniel. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to open up with me to Daniel chapter 1. Uh, and as you're turning there, uh, I, I want to tell you a little bit about this guy. It's really interesting. This guy is a really unique character in, in the Old Testament of the Bible, the first part of the Bible. He's an Israelite. And he plays a really unique role in, in his life. Uh, but it all starts uh, in the first part of Daniel because that's why it's called Daniel 1. Um, and so this is the beginning of his life. This is how we begin to introduce be introduced to Daniel, and, and here's how it reads. It says this, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Judah was the southern kingdom of Israel. It, like, at some point they split, and this was the south. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, king of where? Have you heard of Babylon before? Have you heard of an ancient wonder that was in Babylon? There were hanging gardens. It was ancient, one of the ancient, seven ancient wonders of the world. Uh, he came to Jerusalem and besieged it, and the Lord delivered. Uh, another word for delivered is gave. That'll become important later, so just for now delivered. He delivered the king of Judah into Nebuchadnezzar's hand, along with some of the articles of the temple of God. Then he carried off to the temple of his God in where? So here's what's really interesting. If you re have read the Bible or been around like church in the Bible for a while, um, that word Babylonia, the Hebrew word for it is, it's, it's, a, it's a place. And it's the Hebrew, it's Shinar. And, and there's actually another reference in the Bible to Shinar. And it's in the book of Genesis, when the people of the world get together and try and kind of rebel against God and build this tower that's called the Tower of Babel. Uh, and I've never until this week put together Babylonia and Babel that they could potentially be the same place. And in Hebrew, both of them are Shinar. There's the Tower of Shinar, and then this, they took all the, the artifacts to Shinar. And so this is the same place. That doesn't really impact the story at all. I'm just kind of a nerd. So for what it's worth, that's what it is. But he takes all of it, puts his treasure there. Then he orders Ashpenaz, chief of the court officials, to bring into the king's service some Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, qualified to serve in the king's palace. What kind of families did these guys come from? The rich. What else? Royalty. The royalty. These are, these are princes and princesses, potentially. Or certainly, they're, they're high society people. Would you agree? Yeah. What if you had a handicap? Would you be picked? No. No, because you couldn't have any physical defect. Is that fair? No, but that's how ancient Babylon did it. Uh, the aptitude. So, so I, uh, sometimes I say this uh, because sometimes I'm mean. Uh, that there's like pretty people and there's smart people and some people are really pretty. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, these guys are both. Right? They had to be good-looking and without defect. They also had to be really, really, really intelligent. And, and those are the people that potentially could be qualified to serve in the king's palace. And then it goes on and says this, that, that that guy, that official, was to teach these guys the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from whose table? David. Babylon was probably the world power at this point. So how good is that food? Good. This is probably the best food in the world. Yeah, they're probably eating lobsters. Um, the loser lobsters, though. Uh, the winning ones were still hiding. They, they were to be trained for how long? Three years. So this isn't a quick training, right? This literally, the, this whole first chapter is three years in one chapter. Uh, and they went in, they, and then eventually they would enter the king's service. So what's really interesting is, is that he was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. It's no surprise that he would try and indoctrinate them with, with his culture's ideas and teachings 
teachings and education. What's really interesting is what his culture's ideas in education were. It was kind of a Chaldean thing, and, and according to one source I found, basically it said this, that, that this Chaldean education w was probably defined in terms of vocation as people who were well-known for their work in astrology, dream interpretation, fortune-telling, and magic. And if you know anything about the Hebrew God, he, was pretty much, he pretty much told the Israelites all that stuff was evil. But not dream interpretation, but magic in this sense, uh, fortune telling for sure, uh, and, and really soothsaying, astrology, looking at the stars and trying to predict people's future. These are all things that up until this point, these young men had been told were, were evil. And now they're about to be indoctrinated with it for how long? Three years. That's kind of a big deal, wouldn't you agree? And so then they go on and they do this. They change their names. Among those chosen from Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. Daniel, he names Belteshazzar, Hananiah, Shadrach, Mishael, Meshach, Azariah, Abednego. Uh, so changes their names. Have you ever met, given someone a fake name? Yeah. Come on. You ever then lived, you ever been around long enough for them to then call you by that fake name and you don't answer to it? No, okay, just me, good. Uh, so I've done that and I hate it because I'm like, I gotta listen for George and then I never listen. Um, n notice these next three words. But who resolved? Daniel. How many guys are there? Four. Who resolves? Um, he resolves Daniel. not to eat the royal food or the wine. Why didn't the other three guys resolve too? Good. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Up until this point, all of this food has been off limits. Like pork and bacon and other meats and probably, well, there was some wine, but this is probably the choicest wine in all the land. And, and these, I, I'm convinced, I could be wrong, but I'm convinced that Daniel resolves the other three guys go, wait, 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 what? No! We were, this is, we, but this is the one part we're looking forward to. Not only that, if you were in a really stressful situation, like let's say most of the people you know are di had been killed and you'd been taken as slaves into a brand new society where you didn't speak their language or know anything about them, and uh, they were going to indoctrinate you for three years with all this different stuff, but they were also going to offer you food. Wouldn't food be kind of comforting in that moment? Is anyone else like, man, it's been a hard day, uh, something like hearty and sounds really, is, right? Food's a comfort thing. And this is the one thing that Dan this, Daniel's okay with everything up until this point, but this is where he draws the line? Why? Why is it up until, why is Daniel okay with his name being changed, learning the stuff he'd been raised to be, think was evil, and, and, and a bunch of other stuff, but this is the place, but not the food. And, and, and here's what I didn't know, this is my best guess, is that in that day, eating a meal with someone was a lot bigger deal than it is now. Um, it was pretty common in the midst of a covenant to, to kind of seal a covenant with a meal together, or even sometimes for meals to be a sign of allegiance, that I would serve you for a long time, uh, I would be faithful to you. And I think what Daniel's saying in a sense is, I'm good with everything else, but I will not serve you before I serve God. Can I tell you what's remarkable about all this? Most people think Daniel was a teenager. And that leads me then to think, if teenage Josh had been this guy, I'd, I'd have been all up in that food. I'm just saying. I know myself well. Um, there's no way. I would not have the resolve to do what these guys did. I just love that there doesn't appear to be a conversation. And so Daniel makes this decision and the rest of the guys are stuck with it. And here's the decision that he, here's what he suggests. God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, uh, I'm afraid that the king who has assigned me to be over your food and drink, if he should see you looking worse, worse off than the others, then, then he would have my head. You want to talk about a high stakes job. Making sure that people eat, no, making sure teenagers eat a well-balanced diet such that they look as good as everyone else around them, and if they don't, you die. I worked with high school kids a long time. I'm thankful I was never responsible for that. Uh, and, and, and this is what he says. And Daniel's response is basically, uh, he says to the guard appointed over them, test your servants, give us nothing to eat but what? Vegetables. Vegetables and nothing to drink but? Water. 
Some people think that the reason this guard agreed to this is because the guard realized that then what he could do is he could eat all the, the food that the king that was brought for these guys from the king's table and he would just have to give up the vegetables and water which probably weren't his favorites anyway. He'd get to eat all the choice food and wine. He just has to not eat vegetables or water. Is anybody else good with that deal? <laughs> right? That's, that's me for sure. Uh, and, and this is what Daniel says. He says he agrees basically give it 10 day test. Let me ask you this. If you ate nothing but vegetables and drank nothing but water for 10 days, at the end of 10 days, what results would you expect to see? Weight loss? What else? Sadness. Sadness. Fair enough. Yeah, I get that. Uh, I, asked, I asked a medical professional what they would expect to see after the course of 10 days, and the medical professional's response was nothing. Because 10 days isn't long enough. He said maybe they'd have fewer toxins in their body. A lot of toxins would probably be gone by that point. But other than that, 10 days isn't long enough to really see anything. But maybe, maybe, maybe it would lean them out a little bit. Does that make sense to us? Perfect. So at the end of 10 days, uh, oh sorry, then compare us with what you see. And so he agreed to test them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the other young men who ate the royal food. Does this surprise anyone? No. If you eat vegetables, will you be healthier? Yeah. Well, okay, supposedly, right? Like, yeah. Uh, and, then, and, and better nourished, right? This makes sense. Um, what's interesting is, uh, I, I looked this up, and, and what? well nourished is like a really politically correct way to interpret the Jewish word. Uh, the word that's actually written is probably better interpreted this way. At the end of the 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and what? If you ate vegetables for 10 days and drank nothing but water and you gained weight, how would you feel? How do you gain weight after 10 days of only vegetables? The only thing I've heard that somebody said is maybe they just only ate avocados. <laughs> but then I thought, I think avocados are fruit. So then that doesn't work. But maybe they weren't good at that kind of stuff. Um, does this make sense to you? And this is what I think is incredible. Daniel agrees to honor God. And it seems like God honors Daniel back. In a way that doesn't really make sense. Because they only ate vegetables. Also, this week, when you're with people eating a meal and someone's like, uh, you know, they want to eat healthy, um, maybe just you should mention this study that was done to them where they took four teenagers and for 10 days gave them nothing but vegetables and they seemed to gain weight. <laughs> and just that your friend should maybe know that. Um, but this is an incredible moment. And Daniel, a guy who's thrown into incredible... I mean, does, does it seem at any point here that Daniel is, like, nervous? Have you picked up Daniel being anxious at all? Does it seem like there's much fear? Think of yourself at 16. If this stuff had happened to you, would you be afraid? I absolutely would. I think we have to remember Daniel is actually a human being. I think he just doesn't talk about it. Because <laughs> we don't like to talk about that kind of stuff. But I also think this. I think he had a lot of wisdom. And I think he knew, he recognized, yep, I'm afraid. And this stuff's okay, but this is the one area I'm not going to compromise in. And, and basically, like an all-in draws a line in the sand, this is the thing I won't compromise in. And if it costs me my life, so be it. And there's something strangely assuring about getting to that point. When you know exactly what you will stand for and exactly what you want, when the lines are clearly drawn, it's strange, but there's a lot of peace there. And I think this is what Daniel does. Is Daniel opposed to change? Only in one area. Every other area. Does he have a problem with being called something different? No. Doesn't seem to. Does he have a problem with learning a whole bunch of stuff his parents have told him is wrong his whole life? Doesn't seem to. Does he have a problem with learning a new language? Doesn't appear to. And maybe he does. I have no idea. But what I do know is this. Daniel understood what was worth standing up for and what didn't. And I think it freed up a lot of the anxiety for him. The story kind of ends uh, this way. So the guard takes them away, takes away the choice food and drink, which is like a punishment, right? <laughs> like, no more food for anyone. Uh, and gave them vegetables. Uh, God gave these four men knowledge and understanding in what kinds of literature? All, All kinds of literature, including that mysticism, uh, soothsayer stuff. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Now, what's interesting is, if you look here, uh, it, it says that God gave knowledge. Right in the middle, you see that? God gave. There's three things in Daniel 1 that God, it says God gave. Uh, the first is that God gave the Israel king into the Babylonian king's hands. The second one is that God gave Daniel favor in the eyes of the chief official. And the third one is that God gave all four of them this great knowledge and wisdom. I like it when God gives me number two or number three. Would you agree? I love it when God gives me favor. And I love it when, well, I don't know that I've ever had that happen. 
when I have knowledge on every aspect of literature and wisdom. That hasn't happened yet. You know what, what I don't like is when God gives me things like number one. God shakes it all up in number one, would you agree? Everything that Daniel had known up until that point, everything that had been good, I don't think, do you think Daniel would have been like, you know what the best thing that could happen right now is? If all of Israel just got defeated and a bunch of us got dragged off as slaves. Do you think Daniel would like pick that? No. I certainly wouldn't. And yet, it is because of the first thing that God, the second and the third thing come. Matter of fact, you couldn't have the second and the third thing if you didn't have the first. And sometimes, sometimes, at least for me, when I'm worried, one of the things I need to remember, one of the things that will help me break the cycle of worry is to remember that God's got me. That, that up until this point, God's had me. And this new thing's new. I, I don't know how it's going to go. But I think God's got me. The story ends uh, at the end of the time set by the king. Uh, the official presented at the end of three years, he presents them to the king. The king talked with them and found no one equal to those guys, so they entered the king's service. Uh, in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned, he found them how much better? Then all of the magicians and enchanters in this whole kingdom. These guys learned this stuff they'd been told was bad their whole lives. They learned it so well, they were considered ten times better than anyone else they worked with. Do you think this might create some workplace tr conflict? <laughs> Like, can you imagine if you wanted to work one day and it's like, well, Steve, you did a pretty good job. Bob here is ten times better than you. It's pretty hard to feel good about yourself, right? Like, well, at least I'm one-tenth of Bob. Um, the, this is, and it's going to create a whole bunch of conflict. Matter of fact, at one point, three of those guys, not Daniel, but the other three, are going to eventually get to this place where they're standing at a furnace of fire. And the people that are trying to push them into the furnace are dying. Because it's that hot. And, and then eventually, Daniel is going to end up on the edge of, of a den of lions and get pushed in for three days. And I'm convinced that Daniel doesn't go to the lion's den, and I'm convinced the other three guys don't go to that furnace if they don't first say no on the vegetable thing. God didn't start with the lion's den. He started with food. Amen. <laughs> right? God doesn't start with the big challenge. He starts with, with the first step. If you're familiar with a guy named David, God doesn't have David fight Goliath first. First, He starts him off real easy with just a bear and a lion. No big deal. <laughs> and works up to Goliath. And I'm convinced that for many of us in this room, the step of breaking the cycle of worry is just taking that first step. It's getting five feet closer to the tarantula terrarium, right? It's not immediately touching the spider. Now, if, if you want some like really practical advice. At one point, the disciples are asking Jesus, and they're kind of troubled, and Jesus' response at one point is this, I've told you these things so that you, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you'll have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. <clears throat> uh, when I was uh, in high school, I got my wisdom teeth taken out. Have you ever had your wisdom teeth taken out? Yeah. Isn't that just the best? Yeah. It's so much fun. Uh, and, and I was the first of my friends to get my wisdom teeth taken out, which sucked, because I couldn't ask anyone what it was like. But after that, you know it was fun? Every single person that came to me like, I found out I'm getting my wisdom teeth taken out tomorrow. What's it like? Um, you, either A, you could freak them out. Like, oh, it was terrible. I had blood in my mouth for weeks. I couldn't eat any solid food for a month. It was terrible. Uh, or more realistically, what I told them is, you know, it's really not that bad. And that eased them because I had been there already. Right? I had done it, come out the other side, and therefore I could help them. And sometimes I think we downplay the value of God putting me through something, in part maybe to help somebody else later cross the same bridge. Jesus says this, trouble's coming. But, I've already gone through it before, and I made it out the other side, and I'm here to help you through it. He's been there. Here's the second thing. I was looking at this um, philosopher. Uh, his name is uh, Will Smith. You might have you might have heard of him. And uh, he he tells this story. He said he and his friends were out one night and uh, having a good time uh, in the evening at a particular establishment that you can probably fill in for yourself. And somebody was like, "Dude, we should go skydiving tomorrow." And everyone was like, "Yeah, that sounds awesome." And then he got home. And it was just him. And like he said in waves, the realizations hit him. I said I was going to go skydiving tomorrow. That's a bad idea. 
oh no. And so the next morning, uh, well, let's be honest, he didn't sleep. Uh, then morning came and he drove to the skydiving place and none of them talked, but they all had the exact same night. In bed, tossing and turning, freaking out about this thing they were like, that seemed like such a good idea a few minutes before. And they, they, they sit through the safety briefing for skydiving. And they're like, so if your parachute doesn't open, wait, 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 what? And they're like, don't worry, there's a second one. Well, what if the second one doesn't work? And then they just said, then you probably die. That was not helpful. Uh, and they, they proceed to then get all their gear on and they walk towards this plane and they sit down on the plane and this particular plane had a red light, a yellow light, and a green light. And guess what light was lit up right then? Red. red that's right. But guess what they were all looking at? Green. green. And, the, and the door closes and the plane takes off and they are now 10,000 feet in the air. And at 10,000 feet, a buzzer goes off and there's, th this guy goes and he opens the door to the airplane. Will Smith said he'd been in airplanes a whole bunch in his life, but they'd never opened a door in one. And he said now, he said, there's a whole big difference between looking out through a window and through a door that's open. Uh, and eventually that red light moves to yellow and they all stand up. And now their person that's jumping with them hooks into them because guess why? There's no going back. At this point, you're strapped to another human being and they proceed to slowly get into this line. So now you can see the fear that's coming. And Will Smith says he viv vividly remembers standing on the edge and his guy goes, we're going to jump on three. One, two, and he goes on two because at three you grab stuff. <laughs> And he talks about, he says, he says all the anxiety and the worry he'd felt in the, in the time leading up to it. He didn't sleep the night before. He'd been sick on the way there. The entire hour from like the safety briefing, all the way up to the sky, everything was miserable. He, he was so, so, so miserable. He said, and then they, their feet left the plane and the immediate emotion that hit him was bliss. And for a moment, he was doing what he'd always wanted to but been told he couldn't. He was flying. Or to quote Buzz Lightyear, he was falling with style. <laughs> and all of a sudden things changed. And now the anxiety before melted away and it was replaced by this just wonder and joy as he free falled but with some control they did flips he started to notice things he missed before like hey that's where I work or like hey there's where I live or check out that building or look at this and he eventually goes back and he asks this question. He goes, why did, I, why did I let anxiety get to me in my bed? It didn't help anything. Why did I let this come? And, and, and then he says this, and I've got to skip through a few slides, so sorry about this, but he says this, God sometimes places the best things in life on the other side of terror. And I thought, man, that's profound. And this isn't true of everything or all things. This was just true of what Will Smith experienced jumping out of a plane, which, to be clear, I'll never do because I'm a rational human being. Um, but I just, I, you may have experienced something similar to this if you've ever heard yourself describing something to someone in this way. It wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. You ever said that? Oh, it wasn't as bad. That's what Will's talking about. I'm amazed how often I get myself all worked up with anxiety and then I actually get to it and it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. And I'm convinced that we serve a God who's in control. Matter of fact, the Bible actually tells us this. It says that there's no fear in love, but instead that perfect love drives out fear. You will not find perfect love from a person on this earth. The people that you love, love you imperfectly, right? We get this, don't we? Like, you love them a lot, I get it. But is your love perfect? Mine isn't. But there is a God who, who has perfect love. And I'm convinced that looks like a couple things. One is he's with us. Like, like in the skydiving analogy, he's the one strapped to our back. Which is good news, because in Will Smith's case, he didn't listen to any of the safety briefing he said. <laughs> Once they said if your second parachute opens, doesn't open, you die, he said, I didn't listen to anything else that came after that. And so thankfully there was an instructor strapped to his back who listened to all of it, right? And who knew it. And who had done it before. And who had landed safely. And who came out the other side. And who says, I've done it before and it's going to be okay. And yeah, it's scary. But I'm with you. And the second thing I'm convinced of is this. I was thinking about this on the way here this morning. Why do I worry? And I, this is just for me. But I worry because, A, I'm afraid that things can't, that they won't get better than they currently are. 
right? Like things right now are good enough. I want to keep them this way. If I were to go chase some dream or take some big risk, it may not turn out as well as things are right now or as good as things are right now. Sorry. And so I'm, I'm, I don't want to, I, I worry because I don't want things to change from where they are right now. And, and two, be, I worry sometimes because I'm afraid I'm not going to be up to the task, that I'm going to fail. Or three, I worry because I realize I have zero control. You ever felt one of those? You ever worried about one of those? You ever worried that things might, this might be the best things get? You ever worried that maybe you're not gonna, you had to worry that like, man, I may not be able to do that. What if I fail? What if I, what if I? Or have you ever had worry that's just wrapped up in I have, I have no control? Because if you have, then man, maybe the best thing I can tell you, the best way you can break the cycle is to start by remembering that the one that loves perfectly is with you. The one that loves perfectly is in control. And there may be times when he's strapped to your back and he does things and you don't get it. But at the end of the day, he's the one with the parachute. He's the one that's done it before. He's with us. And, and if he's with us, and if he's done it before, and if his love is perfect, then why would I be afraid? And it was really interesting to listen to Will Smith talk about that at no point in free fall did he have any fear uh, in that he had total faith in a stranger strapped to his back. And those of you that skydived, do you feel that way too? Yep. What is it about that? Except for that they've done it before. They've come out the other side, apparently, because they're still with you, right? And I think Jesus is the same way. I think one of the things that Jesus offers us in the midst of our anxiety and our worry is that he's with us and he's done it before and because of him, we don't need to be afraid. That he's in control and he's got it. He's got you. Even through the stuff you don't understand. So maybe this week, maybe this week, you should remind yourself because this is something I know to be true, but there's a difference between knowing and believing. Would you agree? There's things I know to be true, but I don't believe them. When, when things go bad, I, I don't really pay attention to things I know to be true. Or I pay attention to the things I believe. Maybe this week it'd be great to remind yourself that the God who loves perfectly and the God who's in control is the God that's strapped to your back. And because of that, I don't need to be afraid.